Hello. Welcome to another edition of the Delicious Legacy Podcast. I'm Thomas Dinas. I hope I find you well um, during this uh, lockdown period. Today's episode is all about the food of Roman Britain. Cold, wet, foggy, miserable. These are some of the words that might be used sometimes from uh, new students coming to study in the UK, especially from Italy and Greece. It's unfair, of course. Um, it's really harsh, but that's um, maybe the first... Um, impressions that these students have when they come here to study on, on the first semester, especially if they go to northern towns and cities. Well, I can tell you that uh, nothing has changed uh, since uh, Julius Caesar times. Take, uh, for example, the following lines. It is the home of men who are complete savages and lead a miserable existence because of the cold. And therefore, in my opinion, the northern limit of our inhabited world must be placed here. This is, um, this is by Diodorus Siculus, a Greek historian from Sicily, who lived more or less at the time of uh, Julius Caesar and um, the ascent of the Roman um, re- empire from the Roman Republic who is uh, famous for writing the monumental history Bibliotheca Historica between 1630 BC, so at the height of Rome's power. Or take the following line. The nights are short. Caesar, Gallic Wars and the weather miserable, with frequent rains and mists. I don't want to be Caesar, stroll about amongst Britons. Florus rides to Hadrian and endure the Scythian winters. It is a savage place, as they are fierce, inhospitable Britons who live there. Those near the coast in Kent might be a little bit more civilized, but in the interior, they do not cultivate the land, but share their wives with the family members, live on milk and meat, and wear the skins of animals. These behaviors all seemed uh, all too foreign to Romans. Well, you might wonder what all this has to do with um, with Roman British food, but let's carry on. Um, you'll see. One of my favorite people from antiquity, um, who, although we know a bit about him but his work uh, hasn't survived, is Pythias, who was a a Greek navigator, explorer, mariner and geographer from Massalia. And Massalia was an ancient Greek colony, which is in the south coast of France. Today we know it by the name of Marseille. Um, So it's a very, very ancient city with Greek roots. Uh, So Pythias was from Massalia, and uh, around 325 BCE, supposed to be the first person from the Mediterranean to reach Britain and describe it in detail. Uh, supposedly he reached uh, Bellarium, uh, the land's end in Cornwall, where he visited the tin mines, uh, which uh, were famous all around the, the ancient world. Tin was a very important um, export from, uh, from Cornwall, since um, it's 
it's used to make bronze. So Pythias, uh, he claimed to have explored a large part of Britain on foot. He accurately estimated uh, the circumference of, uh, of Britain at uh, 6,400 kilometers or, for th- or around 4,000 miles. Uh, he also estimated uh, the distance from the north of Britain to Massalia at 1,050 miles, which is around 1,690 kilometers. Uh, the actual distance is 1,120 miles. So you see, he must have been around, he must have come around and um, uh, visited on foot as well as circumnavigated the whole of uh, uh, the main um, island of Britain. It is said that he also visited some northern European countries and he may have reached the mouth of Vistula River on the Baltic Sea. He also talks about Thule, the northernmost inhabited island, six days sail from northern Britain and extending at least to the Arctic Circle. The region he visited may have been Norway or even Iceland. So Diodorus, the historian we, we saw earlier on, based on Pythias, he reports that Britain is cold and subject to frosts, being too much subject to the bear. And by bear, uh, I'm pretty sure he means uh, the constellation of Ursa Major. The numerous population of natives, he says, live in thatched cottages, store the grain in subterranean caches and bake bread from it. They are of simple manners and are content with plain fare. They are ruled by many kings and princes who live in peace with each other. The troops fight from chariots, as did the Greeks in the Trojan War. So does it surprise anyone that uh, the modern Italians hold very similar views about the old Albion? It doesn't really surprise me, to be honest. But uh, enough uh, with the name-calling, the slander and the propaganda. Let's get into delicious legacy territory now, yeah? Some gastronomic history. Okay. Let's start with, um, well, some obvious things, really. Rome's world empire stretched uh, from the banks of the Euphrates River down in modern-day Iraq, all the way to the western shores of Lusitania, which is uh, modern-day Portugal for you and me, and from the Libyan desert to the marshy banks of the lower Rhine. A vast landscape with many different people, cultures, and of course, climate and food. So it doesn't need saying, Rome needed a vast army to control all these far distant and almost alien lands, alien to the local Italian soldiers. And of course, this army was hungry and needed to eat. Standard army rations and standard officers' luxuries traveled hundreds of miles by cart and by river barge to reach distant units. Tax collections were dispatched inwards. Army pay and retirement bonuses were sent outwards, swelling a monetary economy in these far-flung provinces. Along with the economy, there was a massive administration to go with it as well. And, of course, all these people needed um, to be fed. Roman armies tried to invade Britain twice, but the first one of Julius Caesar was not meant to be. Claudius, the fourth emperor, succeeded where Caesar had failed. The emperor himself only spent a fortnight in the cold, wet province, but the invasion he ordered had resulted within 60 years in the conquest of, the, of all of the South Britain. As far as Solway Firth in one side, between Cambria and Dumfries, and the River Tyne in the other side. 
three or sometimes four legions were stationed in Britain. That would be around 20,000 men at its peak, and it was roughly about a tenth of the whole Roman army's strength. That's quite a lot of men. Britain was a wild and dangerous place when the first legions landed in Kent. So far from home, Romans in Britain demanded wine to drink, lentils to eat, walnuts, figs and olives to chew. All imported, of course. As the years passed, experiments were suddenly made with planting vines and walnuts, with extensive vineyards, quite possibly for commercial large-scale production as far north as Northamptonshire. Roman soldiers and civilians expected familiar flavors in their food, such as the celery and the carrot, the fennel and the coriander, the pears and peaches and mulberries of the warm south. These demands made a lasting difference to the food and drink of Britain, for all this and many other fruits, vegetables and herbs. Some examples here, cherry, plum, fig, cucumber, chive, cabbage, lettuce, garlic, onion, marjoram, parsnip, hair, the animal, <laughs> rosemary, turnip, pheasant. All these were introduced to the island in Roman times and in most cases have grown here ever since. Of course, fez and the hair, being animals, um, they escaped and um, became part of the um, fauna of the British Isles for the last 2,000 years. So you see people, um, the Romans, just, just as the Italians today, they need the comfort of their home food which is fine, of course, everybody does that. But um, yeah, it just strikes me as, um, <laughs> as something that, that, that hasn't changed a bit for 2000 years now. Anyway, so until the Roman invasion, um, so what did the local lads eat? What was um, the food, what was the food of Britain pre-Roman invasion? Well, until, until the, the Roman invasion, the most common dish uh, would have been some sort of uh, pottage, a thick vegetable stew or some kind of a soup, flavoured perhaps with bog myrtle, which is a bush type of um, plant, uh, with, which is quite aromatic, a little bit bitter, um, and has some sweet notes as well. And um, the food would be served in bowls made of unleavened bread, with the occasional salted pork, bacon, or seafood, and of course, um, lots and lots of wild game. Well, everything changed after 43 AD. What we know, it's um, mostly from archaeology, not from uh, literature. Thank God for tireless archaeologists then. The Romans wrote very little that survives, of course, about their most northerly province. But, lucky as we are, writings of uh, Romans in Britain have come quite unexpectedly to light. In one of the northern um, forts, very close to the northern border, a fort called Vindolanda, in the remote valley of the South Tyne, close to where the Hadrian's Wall would soon be built, a collection of letters, official and private, written in ink on thin sheets of alderwood, and discarded around 100 CE, has been excavated and painstakingly deciphered. One of these is an invitation to a lady's birthday party. Another seems to be a day book recording supplies uh, issued to soldiers. June 24, barley, 12 gallons, beer, six gallons, wine, three and a half gallons, vinegar, two pints, Maria, one and a half pints, 
pork fat, 15 pints. What is a little bit surprising on this list, at least uh, when you reread it, is the fact that there's more beer than wine. Earlier on, uh, we said that um, Romans demanded wine to drink things from home and so on. But clearly the influence was not all one way. Somebody at Vindolanda required twice as much beer as traditional wine. Of course, along with um, everything else, the Romans uh, brought urbanism into Britain. Theatres made of marble in the cities, luxurious villas around the countryside with mosaics and baths and underfloor heating. All technological marvels and luxuries that surely must have enticed the elite of the local Britons to join the ranks of the Roman conquerors and adopt similar customs and eating habits too. The kitchen of a Roman British country villa, or its uh, town counterpart, would have included many of the above-mentioned foreign foods imported from all over the Roman Empire. You would have amphorae, which would have held uh, imported wine and olive oil. Other imports, which would be, uh, which would, which significantly would have enhanced uh, the taste of, of the urban Britain's food, were oriental spices, such as pepper, ginger and cinnamon. So in, in these uh, said kitchens, you would have found um, a dish called, or something similar to it, Minutal Massianum. This is a recipe from the book of Apicius, and um, as I can attest, after several attempts, some more successful than others, um, this is a very delicious dish. But what is it? Um, minutal Massianum, it's pork with apple to you and me, and um, of course these two things, they have been served for centuries in Britain together. And it's a, it's a tasty dish, we know that already, and also it's very close to our modern palates. But also, crucially, it sounds like a hearty and warming late autumn stew that would have been served on the tables of the Roman British administrators and other nobles. The herbs and spices were all available in Britain at the time, whether grown here or imported. Even fish sauce, garum, the sauce we dedicated the whole episode for, remember a few months back? That was made in Britain too. An archaeological site near London is unmistakably a Roman garum factory. In any case, the name for this dish must be from uh, Gaius Matius, a friend of the Emperor Augustus. Was this dish invented in his kitchen, or described in his household book, or the apples used for it developed by him? Anyway, regardless of that, I'll put um, the recipe up on my Patreon page for all of you to see, alongside with photos and other interesting facts about the dish. In brief, this is a stew with pork, apples, leeks, beef meatballs, lots of herbs, white wine and white wine vinegar amongst the ingredients. Of course, Romans were big eaters and extravagant eaters, so the Roman cuisine also included a lot of wildfowl, uh, like swans and geese and duck, which uh, of that were avail plenty available in uh, the thick forested uh, Britain of the day. Duck was uh, served sometimes boiled in a broth and um, served with boiled parsnips. Game was either roasted or boiled in seawater and served with uh, highly flavoured sauces. Apicius recommended making a sweet, fruity sauce with reduced wine and dates, dried damsons or prunes. As we mentioned earlier, uh, Romans brought urbanization to Britain. Alongside with it, uh, another Roman urban tradition which was brought was uh, thermopolia, as they called them. Of course, we know them today as fast food joints. In large towns, after the rapid urbanization that occurred, people wanted access to quick food during their lunch breaks. And vendors and street sellers would be seen selling grilled shellfish, some sort of kebabs, chicken legs and lamb chops. This form of street food became available by and large. And many of the most interesting and popular foods to this day were introduced here, 
most of them we have seen earlier. One other recipe um, that's included here in this, in this new foods, and it was a street food, and this may surprise a few, a few of you, is Isitia omentata, which, um, which can be seen as the Roman predecessor to today's burger. That's right, you heard it here. Romans invented burger. Not the Americans, my friends, not the Americans. Ancient Roman, the burger is ancient Roman. If you ever wondered uh, what have the Romans ever done for us, this is the one thing for me, guys. Forget the aqueducts and uh, the roads and everything else. And the Roman burger was far more classy affair and upmarket uh, compared to the cheap and often nasty and plain variety one finds nowadays to some very popular joints, which, uh, for legal reasons, shall remain nameless. The recipe from Apicius is perhaps more complex, richer in texture and flavorful, but it's as easy to make as any other burger recipe today. So why not make it? So let me tell you the recipe then. The ingredients listed here are for four burgers. 500 grams of minced meat. Either pork or beef will do. 60 grams of pine kernels. 3 teaspoons of garum, the salty fish sauce, which you can find um, in um, either specialist um, eastern shops, Thai or Vietnamese, or in um, the supermarket aisles today. Ground black pepper, as much or as little as you want. A handful of fresh and aromatic coriander. Uh, a few juniper berries, crushed and coal fat, which of course uh, it's optional if you are a bit squirmish, but I think it's very very tasty and it's very, I think it's easy enough to find in, in butchers nowadays. Um, it's a very thin fatty membrane which um, you dip it in very hot water and then you can stretch it and expand it and it's really really um, becomes really see-through basically and then you wrap this around your patty um, so yeah the method in a pestle and mortar crush your pine kernels and grind them to a fine powder then mix this with the minced meat and the rest of the ingredients shape the mixture into patties wrap this in cold fat and cook over medium heat or barbecue for five minutes on each side. Serve them in a flat bread bun. <laughs> we can imagine uh, the hungry legion soldiers tucking in into a freshly made patty straight out of the hot embers, grabbing it uh, with a flat bread to hold it while it's hot and eat it with uh, some onions and cheese, which uh, the, those two have been the staples of the Roman army soldiers, Russians, for more than 500 years. Or, you can imagine eating it um, with bread and some sauce called uh, mitotos, which is a relish made from garlic, leeks, cheese, honey, and olive oil. Very popular in ancient Athens, and no doubt it was copied in Rome too. So, I guess, um, for the next two, 300 years, that's how life um, went, really, around the British Isles. The new Roman British elite was able to demonstrate their high status by inviting uh, their aristocratic neighbors to dine, and dine they did lavishly on food imported uh, from around the Roman Empire. Throughout the Roman Empire, uh, we know that banquets were elaborate affairs when numerous courses of food were served and wine was consumed to excess. And this, no doubt, would have been true in Roman Britain too. I'll post uh, some photos on my Patreon page with uh, Roman age uh, kitchen utensils and of course uh, dinner, dinner tableware uh, found around UK Roman sites. And so you can see how interesting was the wealth of Roman Britain. Did everyone join though on this feast, on this lavish dinners and symposium? 
most likely not. There were still um, people resisting the Roman invaders. The majority of native Britons lived in small villages and tribal loyalties were far more important to what loyalties could be had with the invaders and the Roman administrators and governors. Uh, one um, tribe called uh, Coriel Tauvi, which is uh, from the center north of uh, today, today's England, well, it appears uh, the high status um, people remained largely beer drinkers rather than moving to wine. And uh, I think they kept with uh, the native practice of hunting and eating wild game. So I guess if what you eat is more part of your essential core culture than how you prepare the food and serve it, which is what the Romans did with the lavish uh, dinners and symposia, then this, I think that shows the persistence of a native culture under the veneer of the Roman. And so after a few hundred years, we arrive at the fall of the Roman Empire and um, the withdrawal of the legions uh, from uh, Britain. All of this, of course, was by no means sudden. It happened slowly and over, over a few hundred years. And then the Britons entered a different, more austere phase. Unable to maintain the big urban city centers and the Roman trade routes. People forgot Latin. Hadrian's wall was abandoned. Weapons dropped on the ground and left behind. London suburbs were tilled for farming. The native people adopted the cultures of other invading tribes or reverted to a simpler pre-Roman existence, living in thatched longhouses. Some of the ancient hill forts bursted back to life. Sadly, we don't have much written records on what the Saxon warlords and their subjects ate on these post-Roman times, but we can assume they had bread, honey, ale, animals like cows and sheep for cheese, butter and meat. For some reason, unfortunately, it seems that <laughs> It wasn't high in their list of priorities back in the day to write down the recipes um, or tell us what type of beer and cheese and bread they were making. So unfortunately, we don't have uh, much information from that period. And so it ends. The foods of the Roman Britain. Thanks for listening. I've been Thomas Dinas, and this was the Delicious Legacy podcast. I hope you enjoyed it, and if you want... Um, to write to me with comments, thoughts, suggestions, and anything else, please feel free to contact me on Twitter. The handle is Delicious Legacy. And um, you can find me on Patreon as the Delicious Legacy podcast. Please subscribe and help me make uh, this podcast even better. Thank you. Stay safe. Solicone estito zen, totelo
Κύριος ο χρόνος απέτει. Όσον τζες φαίνουν μηδεν όλος υλίπου προς ολίγον έστι το τζεν το τέλος ο χρόνος απέτει.